Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. I'm sure that over the last couple of days, those of you who like to stay abreast of the goings-on in the sim racing community are well aware of what's been going on with, quite honestly, one of the best guys that we have in the sim racing community, Sim Racing 604, run by a guy called Mike, who lives in British Columbia, Canada. He has been the subject of what has to be the most utterly obtuse and patently wrong thing I have ever seen happen in the 21 or so years that I've somehow been involved in sim racing. Certainly the most absurd thing that I have ever seen happen in my, now I'm in my 12th year on YouTube. Over the last couple of days, Sim Racing 604 has been hit with a multitude of DMCA copyright takedown requests from an organization that we shall call a bad actor in the sim racing community. I will not name this organization in this video, but those of you who know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And there have been a number of prominent YouTubers thus far who have already spoken on this issue, and uh, you can go take a look at their videos if you haven't. I'll be linking to a few of them in my description. However, let's say this bad actor has a habit of taking other people's intellectual property, publishing it as their own, and then selling it for profit. They do not have the, the permissions or other permits from the intellectual property, property owners or the copyright holders of the original content that they work with in order to do this, which means that it's theft and fraud and anything else that you would like to call it. However, last week, SimRacing604, he decided to make a video as a public service announcement to talk about what this organization does and basically to save all of you in the community, if you may be newer to sim racing, to save all of you the grief of having to deal with them for yourself. Because, let's be honest, it's sometimes difficult to tell fact from fiction on the internet, and it's very easy to get drawn down a rabbit hole of all of a sudden throwing money at something that you haven't researched. So, Mike decided to try and save all of you the grief involved in a process like that, and and he made the video that he made. At no point in the video that he made did Mike say anything that was not true and anything that couldn't be demonstrated. However, the bad actor in question decided to hit Sim Racing 604 with a number of copyright takedown requests in retaliation for the video that he made. And we got word today that Mike has received his third and final strike from the YouTube Copyright Compliance Brigade, which means that within seven days, Sim Racing 604 will be no more. Of course, all of the copyright claims that have been levied against Sim Racing 604, I am led to believe that they are entirely baseless and entirely false, and I'm also led to believe that Mike can prove this in court if necessary. However, what I don't want to do here today is talk about the who, what, when, and where, and why necessarily, but I want to talk about why we should all be incredibly concerned with regard to what's going on here. Not only for Mike, not only for his channel, but for sim racing as a whole, and quite honestly, for YouTube and other forms of public created media as a whole. As it stands, the YouTube copyright policy is an incredibly nebulous and incredibly convoluted entity. The long and short of it is, anyone can claim a video, for any reason. And the claimant does not necessarily have to be able to prove that a video that they're requesting be taken down is theirs. The entire burden of proof lies with the person who uploaded the content. In other words, the content creator, in the case of Sim Racing 604, and even in the case of Ferrari Bad 601, because unfortunately I've also been on the receiving end of several DMCA takedown requests, no fewer than 40 in the last calendar year, mind. And just like what Mike has been talking about with his channel, all of those were patently false and demonstrably false in my case as well. However, the burden of proof always falls with the content creator, and this is a YouTube problem. And this is something that YouTube, I believe, is going to have to address in the future. However, when something like this occurs, and the entire burden of proof now falls on a content creator to prove that content that they have created is real, well, it leaves the content creator with very few options. Because the YouTube process does not allow you to present your own evidence. 
The YouTube process gives you a text box where you can write a message which has, I believe, has a maximum length of 5,000 characters. You do not have the opportunity to upload files. You do not have the opportunity to find the contact information for the claimants in question, and nor do you even have the opportunity to view the claimant's content that they allege that you've stolen. In the case here, with this bad actor that has made these claims against Mike, this bad actor has not created content. They certainly haven't created the audiovisual content that they have claimed on Sim Racing 604. However, the burden of proof lies not with the claimant, it lies with the content creator, it lies with the channel owner. Which means that Mike now is in the position of having to prove that he did not create something that doesn't even exist in the first place. It's a lose-lose situation. That's the position that I have been in many, many times as a content creator myself, where you're not afforded the luxury of seeing the content that you allegedly stole, nor are you able to provide the source files, originals, whatever it might be, to the claimant to say, hey, look, this actually is mine. It's geotagged. I can prove when it was created and where it was created. You don't have that luxury. So Mike, per the YouTube channels, it's very limited in terms of what he can do. And this claimant also understands how that process works as well. They don't have to prove anything. At this point, Mike's channel is being taken down because somebody said so. And there's no burden of proof for the claimant. To pull back a little bit and get a sense of why something like this has been done. Well, first of all, we need to talk about what copyright is. First of all, we have a social contract in Western civilization, which basically means that we are going to do everything we can to safeguard our own individual liberties and our civil rights for ourselves as well as for each other. And in the passage of time, the human condition has been such that we cannot always hold ourselves to such high standards. Therefore, we institute governments among men, to paraphrase Thomas Hobbes, so that we may secure those personal liberties and those civil liberties for ourselves and for others through the means of a social institution such as a government. However, the core tenet of Western society is the idea of natural rights, which we have defined in somewhat varied ways over the years. However, they effectively boil down to life, liberty, and property. And there are many, many, many caveats to all of those things. However, one of those tenets, liberty in this case, is defined as the Declaration of Human Rights published by the United Nations in the 1950s, Article 19 of which says, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek and receive and impart information and ideas through any media, regardless of frontiers. Read borders there when they say frontiers. However, what Mike did in his video, talking about this bad actor, he's expressing an opinion there. He's expressing an opinion that is substantiated by fact. However, he is expressing an opinion. The United Nations says that that is an inalienable right that everybody has simply because you're a human being. So point one, when we get into the weeds a little bit more though, everybody has that right, you see. So that means that you have the right not only to say whatever it is that you want, but you also have the right to produce basically whatever it is that you want. And this, of course, is where we get into the idea of patents and copyright because, yes, you have the right to produce whatever it is that you want to produce, be it a product, be it art, be it literature, be it music, fine. You have the right to express yourself in that manner. However, as we've gone through this journey of human civilization, we have also found that sometimes people are dishonest and people like to steal things. So we came up with the idea of protecting the creators, protecting your artists, protecting your scientists and your engineers and your inventors. Anybody who has created something that's novel, be it a tangible object or something that only exists on paper, there are protections that are afforded to you for producing something like this. As far as we go here in the United States, we have a multitude of laws that concern patent and copyright and other forms of intellectual property protection. However, it all starts, believe it or not, with the United States Constitution, which says in Article 1, Section 8, among other things, it says, 
that the Congress may promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So that is a fundamental legal protection that we in the United States anyway afford to a creator. No matter what sort of creating someone may be doing, they may be a scientist, they may be an artist of any sort, doesn't matter. If you've invented something, and something has become a product of your own mental or physical effort, you have rights to that. You have the right to disseminate that as you see fit. You also have the right to protect that from unauthorized users, unauthorized publishers, unauthorized copyists, whatever it may be. That is a civil right that the fundamental law of the United States guarantees to any citizen of the United States. And that standard has effectively been absorbed and implemented and tweaked a little bit here and there in different jurisdictions. But that is something that we, as a conglomerate in the Western world, hold as a fundamental civil right. So that protects Mike in making the video that he did, and it also protects anybody else who has created something. Even this bad actor, had they created something legitimate, something original, they also are afforded that luxury under at least the American legal system, but again, basically this standard is applicable to all of Western civilization. And the reason why you would want protections for intellectual property is pretty simple. Why would someone go through the effort of inventing something, or writing a novel, or composing any sort of music, or, or painting anything, whatever it may be, why would someone go through all of the effort that must be imparted in doing anything truly worthwhile if only they are not entitled to reap the benefits of their labor? That's why copyright exists. There are also other facets of copyright law on which I am by no means an expert, but I know a little bit because I've been unfortunately on the receiving end of it from time to time in entirely baseless claims. However, the DMCA, basically, long and short of that, the world changed an awful lot in the late 80s and early 90s. Computers became a thing. The internet became a thing. And all of a sudden, the average citizen had the ability to distribute basically whatever they wanted to the entire world. And of course, that includes original works as well as copies of original works by someone else. So what something like the DMCA does and the WIPO treaties that were enacted in the mid-90s in Europe, basically they serve to extend the fundamental protections of copyright and other intellectual property standards into the digital realm, the intangible digital realm. But effectively, it's the same sort of mentality, the same sort of rationale. We want to make sure that people who create are able to create and that they're entitled to seek compensation for their creation, be it through their own marketing of it or if they choose to sell the rights to whatever it is that they've created to someone else for distribution, whatever the case may be. We want the locus of control to remain with the origin, the originator of whatever a content or a work of art, whatever it may be. We always want the creator to be the one who gets to call the shots on what happens to the creation. The implementation of copyright law in the digital realm, though, it's not exactly easy because we are talking about intangible forms of media. It's rather easy to pick up a book and then to see somebody else's name on it, for example, and then you pick up another book with another person's name on it, and you turn to page six, or whatever it may be, and you see identical text word for word. But you don't see any sort of attribution, you don't see quotations, you don't see citations, nothing at all. You just see identical content presented at face value in two cases. So clearly, one is a copy of the other. And this is something that is quite obviously demonstrated, because you can take a physical object and say these two things are identical and they've got two different person's names on it so which one is real one of these is obviously a counterfeit fine with digital media you can't quite do that so easily because you don't have anything that you can touch and say oh wait this is exactly the same as that you can demonstrate these things However, it's a little bit more difficult, but if you know what you're doing, you, if you have the equipment, you have the expertise, you have the knowledge of knowing how to spot 
a genuine versus a fake, you can still do this in the digital realm. And if you want to take a look at an absolutely great video that's been put up in the last 24 hours or so, SHR Modding, he talks about how a couple of his products were taken by this bad actor and rebranded as their own and sold for profit. SHR modding his original work, they were sound files, basically alternative sounds for the RSS Formula Hybrid mod, which he distributed for free over on racedepartment.com. He can show you and demonstrate to you how his content is absolutely identical to the bad actor's content and he's done a very good job of pleading his case in that as well. So if you want some absolute proof that the uh, allegations here against this bad actor are not based on nothing, go take a look at SHR Modding's video. I'll link to that in my description here. However, the process by which we can appeal things and uh, order things taken down on YouTube in particular, it's, well, difficult. That DMCA, that Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, again, a piece of American legislation here, but it's what YouTube is operating off of. Basically, the reason why YouTube can get away with the policy that they have is they are effectively exempt from having to comply with the DMCA in as much as they can effectively be deemed a conduit. So in other words, a pipe through which information flows. And I'm uh, reading here from... A summary of the DMCA published by the U.S. Copyright Office in December of 1998. I'll have a link to this in the description as well if you would like. But effectively, it says that the DMCA limits the liability of service providers in circumstances where the provider merely acts as a data conduit, transmitting digital information from one point on a network to another at someone else's request. This limitation, that's a limitation of the DMCA, covers acts of transmission, routing, or providing connections for the information, as well as the intermediate and transient copies that are made automatically in the operation of a network. So in other words, something that's like a cookie or a mirror file, something like that, things that just are there to expedite the digital transmission of information, whatever it may be. In order to qualify for this limitation, the service provider's activities must meet the following conditions. The transmission must be initiated by a person other than the provider. The transmission, routing, provision of connections, or copying must be carried out by an automatic technical process without selection of material by the service provider. That's an argumentation point if you really wanted to take it up. The algorithm, selection of material by the service provider. If YouTube is a service provider, they're using an algorithm in order to push certain content over other content, which means that they are actually selecting the content that you see as the end user, but I digress. The service provider must not determine the recipients of the material. Again, algorithm, your subscriptions, things like that. It does determine what material you see, in which order you see it, when you see it in terms of time and things like that. So again, another argument. Any intermediate copies must not ordinarily be accessible to anyone other than the anticipated recipients and must not be retained for longer than reasonably necessary. Fine, that's network infrastructure. And finally, the material must be transmitted with no modification to its content. Nah, argumentation point there maybe because mid-roll ads and things, technically speaking, that's changing the presentation of content, but it's not necessarily changing the actual content itself. But again, that's for somebody who's much more highly paid than me to litigate in court. But effectively, what the DMCA does is it calls a service like YouTube, and again, YouTube did not exist at the time of the DMCA being ratified, but uh, it effectively calls a service like YouTube a data conduit. It's a tube that information goes through, if you want to take the word conduit literally. So effectively, YouTube is shielded from any sort of wrongdoing in a situation like this. They're merely facilitating the content being found, which means that they're also facilitating any takedown requests that come down. So effectively, YouTube can get away with a policy like this because they are, they're deemed a provider and they're deemed a conduit. They are not deemed a publisher. And this also goes into the whole hornet's nest that we had in 2020 with social media in general and taking posts down and promoting certain posts by others, depending on which political affiliation they had. Things like that were going on as well and still are going on and will probably be litigated in the near future as well. But as far as we're concerned here, YouTube can have this policy where effectively any claim that is levied against a video is taken at face value and is deemed accurate without any sort of burden of proof being levied on the claimant. 
because YouTube is a conduit per the DMCA, which means that they really don't have a say ultimately in what happens here. They can implement their own policy in order to facilitate policing of their platform because obviously they don't want to be distributing stolen work knowingly. Which means that they can implement the three strike rule and they can tie that three strike rule to however many takedown requests have been have been received by a given channel. They could also tie that three strike rule to whether or not it's cloudy today if they really wanted to. Effectively, YouTube's policy, as broken as it may be, it's valid and it's legal. So that's also what you have to remember if you are going to play on this platform. They can shut you down for any reason at all. They don't need rationale. They don't need to prove anything, and they have effective legal protection, and they have infinite legal standing to do so. Because ultimately, you're on their platform. You don't own their infrastructure. They're allowing you to use it as a courtesy. So ultimately, the legal definition of a provider being a conduit for data, that is how this can happen. It's also how abuse like this can happen because as YouTube has implemented their policy, a claimant does not have to prove ownership of any content that they claim. So it's a wash really. YouTube can do what they're doing. The DMCA is nothing to say about that. In fact, the DMCA specifically exempts a provider such as YouTube from having any sort of say in what happens here. The only thing that they have to do is report illegal content when it is brought to their attention. Whether or not that content is actually illegal, it's a completely different argument and it does not concern YouTube as an entity. Which means that abuse like this can occur if a claimant doesn't have to prove that they actually do own the copyright for anything that they're claiming, then that's it. It's a claim. It's valid. It'll stand and SimRacing604 in this case will lose his channel. We can demonstrate it until the cows come home, really, but ultimately the onus is on YouTube to look at it and determine whether or not it's valid, but they don't even have to. All they're doing is basically saying, look, uh, if we were told of uh, stolen content on our platform. We don't want to be distributing stolen content, so we're, we're taking it down and the, the channel that published it is no longer on our platform. And that's where the argument absolutely ends. As far as content creators should be concerned here, they should be very concerned here. Because we can now demonstrate that there is no protection afforded to content creators on YouTube. And we can also demonstrate that content that we've created, content that absolutely is original to us, we can demonstrate that that content can just be taken down if somebody else says that they own it, whether or not they actually do. So a situation like this ultimately removes the incentive for someone like me or someone like you, if you are a content creator as well, it effectively removes any incentive that we have to engage on this platform because we know that nothing we do is safe. We know that absolutely anything and everything that we have ever posted, will post today or will post at any point in the future, we know that anybody can say it's mine, take it down unilaterally. We know that we really don't have any recourse in terms of proving that anything is ours. And YouTube doesn't even provide any facility for us to provide the original source files for our content or any scripts if you've written scripts for a voiceover that you've recorded later on doesn't give you that option. There's no facility in which to do that. If you wanted to try to do that, you would have to try and find the contact information for a claimant yourself, which is not something that's provided to you by YouTube. It's also not something that YouTube has to provide to you. They're not obliged to give you any sort of information like that. If you wanted to pursue that yourself, you absolutely could. However, in many cases, at least in all the cases where I have had any takedown requests, there's basically no surefire way to contact the claimant because in some cases the claimant doesn't even exist. But somebody with a username filed a claim and that's it. So all of the burden of proof, again, is on the content creator. And it's not only burden of proof, but it's now a burden of even trying to figure out who has levied this claim against you because that information is not always available. Sometimes, yes, there is a name of an organization that files a claim. However, they're not obliged to give it to you. And if it doesn't exist, well, it doesn't exist. So contact information, things like that, nope, not possible in the least. So ultimately, this leaves somebody like Mike, who has been on the YouTube platform anyway since 2014, I'm pretty sure. So that's 
seven, eight years, depending on exactly what month he started, whatever it might be. That leaves him with the prospect of losing his channel. He has no ability to prove that his work, which is voluminous, is his at all. And he will be shut down and nobody will ever see his work again. <laughs> Just like that. All because somebody who steals things decided to try and steal a couple more things. It is a very disheartening situation to see. And again, as I said off the top, Mike has been one of the absolute nicest guys in the sim racing community. And that's not to try and say he's a nice guy, so why are you giving him trouble? No, he's, he's a nice guy, number one, but the most important part of what he's done is he's done it all himself. It's all original. You can take a look. You won't find his content anywhere else, which means that only one person owns it, and that's Mike. But this is the system that we're dealing with, and ultimately this is the reality that we have. There's nothing to prove conclusively as far as YouTube's concerned that I own the content that I've created either. There's nothing to stop anybody from flagging this video and saying it's stolen. You could do it right now if you really wanted to, and then I would be gone too, just as quick as Mike has been, if not even quicker. So that is the reality that YouTube content creators have. And in a world where media has been democratized to a large extent, I'm a nobody. I have no contacts in television or the film industry or anything, but I've got over 6,200 people who are subscribed to my channel. They have no idea who I am. They have no idea if I have any background in producing anything like this. They don't know if I have a degree in broadcasting or anything, and it don't, it don't matter. I don't need one. You don't need one. Because this is what entertainment, this is what media has become in the 21st century, and it's an absolutely fantastic thing. It's a wonderful entity that we have in this, in that you can hear somebody who you never would have known even existed otherwise. You can hear what they have to say, and you can see what they can do simply by turning on your computer or, or flicking through your phone or anything like that. Real people, everyday people, no f funny broadcaster degrees or anything like that. We can create this stuff and we can say basically whatever it is we want simply because we have access to what has now become almost a prerequisite technology and we've got voices and all of that is effectively under siege via what's going on with sim racing 604 because ultimately my own voice i can't prove that this is me i can of course but according to youtube i can't so if any of you want to flag this video go ahead you'll win and you'll take me out, and you will never hear from me again. It's that easy. It really is that easy. And it can happen to me, it can happen to Mike, it can happen to you. If you have a channel, and you're watching my video through your channel, and you've, I don't know, got whatever videos that you made nine years ago of your dog, doesn't matter. You don't own that, or at least you can't prove that you own that as far as YouTube is concerned. So when somebody in some far-flung country says, oh, wait, that dog is actually my dog, and I shot that video, it's mine, take it down, bye-bye your video, and bye-bye your YouTube channel. So in the end, where does this really leave us? It leaves us kind of at a stalemate. Because once again, we've demonstrated that we don't really have any incontrovertible way to prove our own ownership of our own content and we have no way of contesting claims like this on YouTube beyond the appeals process which is very easily overridden by an overzealous claimant. Mike from Sim Racing 604 the content that he had been creating really filled a gap that I didn't even know existed in terms of the sim racing community. The sort of content that he created, he kind of did an a la carte restaurant in terms of the videos that he made. Of course, it was all concerning sim racing for the most part, but he would show content of offbeat sims like Race Room, things like that, that I personally would never pay any mind to. It's not my cup of tea. I don't like them. You might like them. That's fine. You're entitled to like them, but I don't. But that's stuff that I never would have seen otherwise. And I'm sure that's the reason why Mike had the number of subscribers that he had. Because I'm not going to feature it. Aiden Millward's not going to feature it. Single Racer's not going to feature it. You know, but Mike did. And it opened our eyes to, oh, wait, there are some other outlets that we can get here in the sim racing hobby. And that's valuable. But for whatever reason, 
fine. You have people who don't like what Mike was saying, and therefore they're able to find a loophole in YouTube's policy as well as in the DMCA and say, oh, I don't like what he says, so take it down. That's what's happened here. And ultimately, that's what can happen to any YouTube channel. It could happen to me the instant this video goes live, for all I know. But that is a gap that will once again be opened up in the sim racing community on YouTube, and I don't know. Will anybody fill that gap? Could I fill that gap? Could maybe Jimmy Broadbent or Aiden Millward, the real heavy hitters here, could Chris Hay fill that gap? I don't know. Will some of us try? Probably. But ultimately, it's not going to be the same because it's not going to be Sim Racing 604 doing it because that was his bread and butter and that's what he was really good at. And that's what made his content worth watching. It was the stuff that you probably haven't seen, but now you're going to be really happy you did. And I have heard numerous stories from people who have contacted me or on other forums I've been on or even in the comment sections of Mike's own videos, seeing the people who are saying that they got into sim racing because of what Mike was able to show them through Sim Racing 604. Or even in my own case, people who have contacted me over the years saying, hey, I got into this because of you. Thank you. It's a really cool thing to be able to to hear people tell you and it, it, it makes you it makes you feel like sometimes this quixotic projects that you feel like they're worthwhile and in those moments and I know Mike had a lot of those moments and I know that the community will very much miss his work because again it filled a gap that was there and I don't think anybody really recognized that it was there until Mike did and then he filled it and he did a masterful job in filling it but that will be no more and whether or not I will try to do something like that or whether or not others will, time is going to be the judge there. But as I said off the top, this is utterly absurd and it should really send shivers down the spines of all of you still listening because it could happen to me tomorrow. It could happen to Aiden Millward tomorrow. It could happen to Jimmy Broadbent tomorrow, you know, and it can even happen to you if you happen to be one of those guys or see even somebody else who is starting off today with your YouTube channel and you want to do something in sim racing or whatever it may be. But those are my two cents here on what's going on with Mike and Sim Racing 604. It's also my two cents on copyright. Copyright's a, it's an important thing. If you want to be creating something in a world, you'd better be entitled to reap the rewards of whatever it is that you've created. But don't abuse it either because you don't own everything on the internet. And you certainly do not have the authority to silence people who have opinions that are different from yours, whether or not you like them. Nope. It's not your call. It's nobody's call. Because it's a human right to be able to say what you think and fear no retribution for it. But that's where we stand here. Sim Racing 604, all I can say, Mike, thank you for what you've done for the Sim Racing community. I hope this ends well. But as of the time of publishing this video, you have six days and a bit hours remaining on YouTube through no fault of your own. That's where we are. It's quite the world, isn't it? As far as what this will mean for Ferrari Man 601, future will tell. I don't know. I'm left sitting here thinking maybe it's time to call it quits. Because if I can't reap the benefits of what I'm going to do, why bother doing it in the first place? Until next time, all we can say is Godspeed, Sim Racing 604. Again, there are about six days left. Hopefully, something can come through with this. And if you want to try and do a little bit of bidding on Mike's behalf, tick my description and uh, there's some contact information for some software developers whose intellectual properties have been stolen by this bad actor. If you want to send some emails out, send some tweets, be my guest. But uh, you're going to be alone in that endeavor, at least as far as I'm concerned. This is my contribution to it. I hope I've informed. And of course, all of us, we all stand with Sim Racing 604 and we really hope that we don't see him go away. Unfortunately, though, that appears to be the case as of right now. Until next time, Ferrari Man 601 saying thank you very much for listening, and we might see you soon.